So just to sort of set the scene, critically, I'm not expecting you to leave this room sort of at the end of the day or indeed after I've spoken, being a mathematician and being able to do what, what I do or, or what colleagues do. Um, but hopefully you'll have a deeper understanding of sort of some of the thought processes we go through. You've already seen Dale's paper, which talks about a range of modelling, but um, uh, hopefully we'll sort of be able to illustrate the simple points that we're trying to sort of try and tease through. So a really kind of, um, wh where does modelling and epidemiology sort of sit together? There are really two um, types of modelling that we do certainly in PHE um, for public health. One is a preparedness role. So there we are sort of playing God, if you like, with a scenario. So we will look at a disease, we'll pick flu or smallpox. We will look at the epidemiology of the disease, how sort of make assumptions about how people mix. And then people will tell us what interventions they have. And the policy makers will tell us what interventions they want us to test. We'll we'll put those into the model. And we'll look at the sort of costs, the benefits, maybe do health economics, um, uh, maybe not, depending on the situation, and um, use that as advice for the planning. Uh, the other function is emergency response. And so sometimes we get lucky and that, that careful planning can be used in a response. We can sort of dust off an old report and say, OK, we've got this, we've actually got this situation now, let's run with that. But most of the time, what we really think of there is real-time modelling. So there we have models that we've developed in advance. And we're fitting those to data, case data or, or other data, to try and work out how bad things will get um, eventually. Um, so, so those two models really sort of come down to sort of something that I'll try and articulate later. But one of those, so in the response setting, you're trying to make predictions. Using mathematical equations, you're trying to make predictions about what will happen in the future. With the preparedness side of things, you're trying to understand the system, understand uh, the way people will behave or react to a disease, so you can um, sort of make uh, generalizations. So, sort of people with engineering backgrounds in the room probably. Um, won't need this quite so much as, as others, but I thought I'd just start, um, have a slide here on, on what is mathematics. So um, mathematics has a very long history, um, going back to ancient times where you had sort of Greeks and Babylonians looking at geometry and um, developing concepts like irrational numbers, which are numbers you can't write down, which doesn't mean you can't write them down, but it means you can't write them down in totality. So the classic example there is root two. You don't, there is no number of root two. It goes on forever if you try and write it down. Um, and root two comes up simply by being the, the line, the hypotenuse on a triangle that has two sides of, unit, of single uh, uh, unit length, so, so length one. Uh, then through the medieval period, that sort of concept gets built on and you start getting algorithms um, from sort of Islamic mathematics um, and algebra. Fibonacci, I've put down there, he's an Italian mathematician um, who really probably created one of the earliest mathematical biolo biological models. So his model um, was for rabbit population growth. And so um, has anyone heard of the Fibonacci sequence? Good, good, good. Okay, there's nods in the room. So the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the previous two terms. So you start off with one and one, and then you get two, and then you get three, and then you get five, and then so on and so forth. Um, and so he developed that to illustrate rabbit growth. And so, so yeah, you start off with two rabbits, um, and then show, assuming they're male and female, you can sort of get them breeding, and you get this growth of the population. It's not a great model, let's be honest, because a field of rabbits is going to have a certain capacity. Um, you're going to get all sorts of inbreeding and stuff, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a starting point for modeling. Then you sort of go through the Renaissance um, and you get sort of lots of interest in astronomy and, and other systems. And there's a bit of a split um, between European maths and, and British maths, where you have sort of the likes of Isaac Newton developing calculus in Britain 
and Leibniz developing calculus on continental Europe. Obviously, Leibniz was wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but but no, uh, they, they, they sort of came up with the same idea at the same time. Um, and uh, the, the, the continental mathematicians also started developing concepts of probability, which we use daily um, in our work. And then in the modern era, you start having sort of in the 70s developments around chaos theory, um, which looked like it was going to be a useful model for, for behavior and things. It's probably not quite as useful as it seemed to be. But you've also got the advances in computing. And so, so nowadays we can solve complicated models very quickly, cheaply, and that, that has made my job a lot easier. Um, but not necessarily helped us understand things because you can have a very complicated model, but you don't know if you fiddle something at the, st the start what impact that has on the long term. And so still having simple models that you can solve almost by hand are, are useful tools. So, so we shouldn't knock simple models. So what do we as modelers do? Um, well, it, it, mathematics is a very hard, uh, is a very um, quantitative subject by definition. Um, but it is quite, and so it's objective. Um, hardly object, hard objective, but really it is quite subjective because we're making choices about ab how we're abstracting the system. So fundamentally, things change um, uh, in any in any system, pretty much. So they could change with time, they could change with space, they could be socioeconomics, it could be, and, and at some level it varies between individual. We'll always react differently um, uh, through through some instinct. Um, and diseases are transmitted differently. Um, so you can have STIs that are infected, uh, spread by sexual transmission. You can have flu that's spread by um, aerosol transmission. You can have bacteria that are spread by from a point source but aren't person to person transmissible. You, so you can get infected in a number of ways. So we have to simplify systems. We have to make an abstraction. And a model is designed to answer one question. Sometimes you can get lucky and generalize, but Often, when you do that, you're on a hiding to nothing. Um, so, 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 yeah, that, that, that's quite an important concept to keep in. This last point here, the model is, al is always wrong, um, is, a true, is often quoted. Um, and so you sort of garbage in, garbage out. It's slightly more nuanced than that, because as a mathematician, I would defend the model. They say the model is right. It's the assumptions and the data that's gone in that are probably flawed. Um, because you have made those assumptions, I mean, me as a modeler have made those assumptions to create the model, and that's based on some evidential platform that was flawed. Um, but that's sort of a nuanced argument we don't have to go into uh, here. So looking at how we look at disease spread, let's start with a simple, um, a simple, simple toy model. Um, so you've got one infected person, and they are guaranteed to meet two people a day, and they will be infectious for one day when you go through. So the first day you've got one person, the next day there are two people, the, next day, the day after that four people, and so on and so forth. Well, if you follow that model, if you follow that, that, that algorithm to its conclusion, after 31 days you've got a billion cases, after 32 cases you'll have more than the population of the world. Diseases don't really travel that fast through a population. Um, even SARS, flu, they don't travel in, through the whole world in a month. So something is wrong in that model. Uh, so what could be wrong? Well, one of the things we've forgotten there is the um, interaction between people. So we may meet exactly two people, but the, the per those two people will be meeting other people. It'd be quite a complicated social network. And so they might have been infected earlier um, in the disease. You, yeah, they may have already met someone who was infected, and so you're not guaranteed to be meeting two susceptible people at each point. So we call that depletion of susceptibles, and that's quite an important factor. Yeah. Um, touch on a point there on infection as to why... Um, in doctor's surgeries, when we're all likely to be 
going in because of an illness and an infection, and we're all targeted to touch and log in on a touch screen in a 25 millimetre square screen, which to me seems a bit, but as you say, the rate that infection can happen seems a bit of an odd thing. It's like diverse from me. You're right, but why are we all expected to go into a doctor's not feeling very yeah. well? I, I think everybody touched this point. <laughs> you, your doctor's obviously more technologically advanced than mine. <laughs> it's, um, it's yeah. Um, uh, I think I think that it, a lot of diseases are not not necessarily spread by phone mate, phone, uh, so so by environmental transmission. I mean, it, there may well be some microbiological contamination on that device, but it's not. It, it, these things decay over time, um, so so I, it's probably not a massive risk. I think is the. Okay. But yeah, so I, I, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's been risk assessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Sorry. You no, know, that's fine. That's fine. And I think the um, if we just think about the transmission mechanism um, in slightly more depth, um, let's just just think that through from a person-to-person -person transmissible angle. So not necessarily the environmental angle, but from a person-to-person -person transmissible disease. You have, say you're susceptible to, to the disease. So you, you go out, you're fairly socially gregarious, you, you meet a number of people over time. Uh, as a mathematician, I like to replace numbers with letters, but that's, that's, uh, that's my problem, not yours. Um, uh, so, so yeah, you meet K people, that's just a number um, over time. But only a fraction of those are infectious. Um, so, so of the total population of the UK, if there's... 10, 10 infectious people in the, in the community, in the, in the country, 60 million people, your chance of infection, of meeting one of those K contacts being infectious is very small. In a room of 10 people, 20 people, slightly different. So, so, so yeah, a certain fraction are infectious. You have basically some probability of the transmission occurring on those contacts, um, and you treat that like rolling a dice. So if I was infected with a disease, um, and I was meeting each of you um, in turn, then basically I'm sort of tossing a coin to see whether I'm going to infect you or not. Um, well, that's at least the sort of mathematical trick we play. Um, and then we say, OK, on a daily basis, the number of people we meet varies fairly randomly, and so one day we'll meet five people, the next day we'll meet nine people, but it will kind of average out, and everyone will kind of average out into this... Um, Sort of homogenous blob, so so everyone's equally likely to meet. And then mathematically, we say, okay, well that's 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 true. Let's make that a very very small time period. Um, hope that's true. And then we'll fiddle around with the notation um, and come up with this equation um, that um, I've sort of copied down there. Um, so, so that's kind of a very simple walkthrough of how we derive. The model, so I'm not expecting you. I mean, there's no exam at the end, I'm not, so, so, so. Um, but hopefully that kind of illustrates the thought processes we've gone through to um, to generate to generate that transmission term. Another complexity or another nuance to these models is that you may actually be immune to a disease once you've had it, once you've been exposed to it. So the common cold, flu, many other infections. If you survive it, most people do from the cold. Um, uh, you. Uh, you're recovered in the long term. Now, there may be multiple strains circulating, so you may get a cold again in a few months or year time, but uh, that particular strain of cold, flu, you're probably protected against. Um, so this is what uh, we call the SIR model. Um, it's been, rather than writing down a set of equations, we can write it as a flow chart. The dotted line means there's a transmission term going back um, from the infected people to the susceptible people. So the SIR stands for susceptible, infected and removed, um, or recovered. Um, and this is the classic building block for all infectious, in, sort of infectious disease models, really, um, from a mathematical viewpoint. Um, and it was proposed in 1927 by Kermack and McKendrick. Um, and it, it is just a very simple foundation. It relies on something called homogeneous mixing, which 
uh, basically means everyone's equally likely to meet that is inherently assuming something about our behavior as humans in how we are socially motivated. Um, and there's no real intervention here. That any intervention is kind of implicitly in the transmission term. <coughs> Using that model, where would people who are say carriers of say for instance one of the hepatitis mm. things where mm. would they fit into mm. that so, so they never become ill themselves no no, no. So, so so one of the points i'm going to sort of I, I was sort of glossing over but was probably sort of going to come back to a little bit was this is the simple building block this is the sort of simplest model arguably you could have a simpler model which was just sis so you the infected people go back to a susceptible class so you recover like a gi infection um, immediately. Um, if you had carriers of the disease or you had, in reality, for flu, you're not immediately infectious. So you have an exp a latent period. Um, for HIV, you have a latent period. So, so you, you can use this as a foundation, as a building block, and you can put arbitrary complexity in to allow for the nuance of your actual model. So you can allow for carriers that never become symptomatic but are still infectious. Um, by, by fiddling around with the equations or the, the boxes, depending on which way you're playing with it. So, so, so yes, it, we, we have a tool which can be arbitrarily complexified, if complexified is a word. Um, let's just, so, so a couple of key concepts um, here from, from that model. Um, you may, either in the media or, or if, if, you, if you listen to modelers speak, uh, one of the things we often bang on about is the basic reproduction number. Now, why do we care about that? Well, what is it? Um, it's the number of sec secondary cases a primary case will infect in a wholly susceptible population. That is, um, basically, it's how many people are you going to infect if everyone else is infect susceptible. And from that SIR model, we can play around with the algebra and define it as the contact rate divided by the length of time you're ill. So. Why do we think that is so important? Well, basically, it tells you whether the disease will fade out, sort of control itself, or whether you have a public health problem. So if it's over one, you've got a bit of a problem on your hands, you need to do something to control it. Um, if it's under one, it's just going to go away on its own. It may take a long time to go away on its own, but it's probably going to go away on its own. From that, so, so that allows for uh, the beta term there, um, uh, allows for human um, mixing assumptions, so our social behaviour. We can build into these models um, by adding extra compartments, some concepts, some interventions. So if we added in vaccination um, and so induced some immunity into a population, we can start looking at something called herd immunity. So that's um, how much of the population we need to vaccinate to protect the country against outbreaks of disease. And from that model, you can play around with the algebra and come up with uh, an equation for the critical vaccination coverage population, which is 1 minus 1 over R0. Um, I can uh, walk you over the algebra for that at co uh, coffee or lunch if you're desperate. But um, basically what that means, if you have a disease that has an R0 of about 20, you're going to have to vaccinate about 95% of the population to protect the country. Um, against it. If your R0 is 5, it's going to be more like 80%. If your R0 is 2, it's going to be more like 50%. So just to give you an idea of different diseases with different r noughts, um, smallpox probably has an R0 of about 5. Um, flu is more like 2. And measles is more like 20. Um, you don't see the, um, in a purely susceptible population, measles is a childhood infection, so the population isn't purely susceptible, so it's not. You don't see those explosive outbreaks um, uh, so much. But that that herd immunity concept is is very um, useful epidemiological tool. So um, the, the the model building process is iterative and collaborative. Uh, we start by sort of being given a problem. We'll look at what data we have um, from surveys or the historical record. We integrate that into the models, we interpret the results, 
and then we inform policy. Now, it doesn't end there um, because the policy makers will say, oh, can you actually look at this or what do you think about this? And we'll go around the loop again and again and again until we're sort of happy. Um, so uh, the, the, I've then just got these sort of case studies of diseases um, uh, really just looking at um, some sort of concepts here. So, so we can plan for flu. We did a lot of work pre-swine flu, sort of from sort of 2002 through to 2009, making sure we had an evidence base for planning for flu. Then even after 2009, we've been sort of continuing that work. But flu is kind of worrying because in 1918, there was a big outbreak, which caused 20 million deaths. There were two other pandemics in 1957 and 1968. There was probably one in the late 1890s, and we had 2009. So they occur roughly every 30 years or so, once a generation. Um, and flu is quite rapidly sort of spreading. After about a week, you're probably over and done with, with it. Um, and it could lead to a sort of large excess of deaths. And so, so, so some of the questions, PHE has a capability to predict how many cases there will be if there was a pandemic. Um, um, as well as sort of the more contingency planning aspects. Smallpox um, is sort of more, uh, slightly diff more nuanced disease. I mean, it's eradicated, so arguably uh, it's not a natural <coughs> disease anymore, but there are still stockpiles of it. There was some concern a few years ago that those stockpiles might be compromised. So we were asked to plan for a smallpox attack, uh, 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 outbreak. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a fairly nasty disease with a 30% case fatality rate. Um, and we, we, we built a um, slightly more complicated model than before where we allowed for space. Um, people, so you had your sort of mixing at a, geog uh, at a home level, a sort of local authority level, and people moved around the country based on the commuter matrix from the census. And um, this is just an illustration of how we can bolt on different interventions. So we can look at contact tracing, we can look at districts at vaccination, and um, sort of mass vaccination, um, and look at the benefits of each strategy and the costs of each strategy. And then uh, reverse epidemiology. So here, what we're looking at is basically trying to predict or work out where something originated from. So this is no longer a transmissible human-to-human -human transmissible infection. This is simply um, a bacterial agent that you become infected with by inhaling a cloud of matter. So, so you have some sort of covert, so you, don't, you don't know there's a problem gone on. Early cases start to appear. That in your surveillance systems, the cases start to go up. Well, how can you predict when the event occurred that caused those and where so you can actually start to sort of lock that, sort of target people to treat. And we can sort of create policy advice um, by prioritising areas of space to give um, to, to target those interventions in. So, uh, just realising that I'm wildly overrunning, but uh, Dale is not uh, got the shepherd's crook off yet, so, <laughs> so I'll just keep going. Um, uh, model complexity. Um, when we're designing models, we have to consider a number of things. That behaviour is either implicitly or explicitly inextricably, inextricably linked with. So there's the transmission process. There may be additional phases of infection, so the latent period or carrying period, um, carriage period. Um, there may be spatial effects. So, yeah, we, I'm not likely to meet someone from Scotland today, but some of the simple models would give some chance of that. Um, so you need to sort of limit your spatial transmission. Age effects, so the classic example there is flu. Children don't have the same hygiene standards as the adults. Um, uh, so, so schools are brilliant dissemination mixing vessels for, for flu and uh, colds um, and GI and all sorts. Um, and so they will... Um, uh, so, so they will get, they will be the main mixing hub, and then they'll take it back to their households, infect their parents, who infect their parents, who, and then it's the old, more, more elderly end of the spectrum that have higher risk of severe outcomes from flu. And so you kind of 
a lot of the advice is to vaccinate children so you limit transmission so that rather um, so that you're protecting those that risk of more severe illness so um, but then there's behavioral effects do people would listen do people change their mixing when there's a disease going on do they um, uh, do they listen to your advice as a government or um, uh, do, do they go and get the intervention, the vaccine, the, count, the, the, the antibiotics, or do they not? Um, is there a seasonal pattern? Is, is there something odd going on with the seasonality? Um, and can, are you actually observing the right disease? Uh, can you see the disease in your surveillance systems? Do you know you've got a problem? So there's a number of sort of aspects here in the modelling co complexity you have to think about when you're designing yeah. a model. Probably why most grandparents pass away in September. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it, yeah, I, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you uh, are, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just, just avoid your grandchildren during the flu season. It's fine. Just see them in the summer. It's fine. Um, so hopefully. Um, from this overview, um, and I've sort of waffled on for longer than my allotted time, but hopefully from this you um, can see that the sort of modelling, it's really a struggle to get the right level, balance between tract tractability and reality. We, we would all love to have a realistic model and sort of individual based simulation that tracked everyone accurately through, through the course of their passage of time. But that's just going to be so data intensive, it's not practical. We have to make simplifications. Um, I've said here, I've underlined it, that models enable prediction and understanding. Um, I think I mean or, in that sense, you, can, you, can, you can predict what's going to happen or you can understand what's going to happen. It's quite difficult to do the and. Um, uh, you, you sometimes can get lucky with a model and, and do the both, but um, often you're looking at past historical record trying to understand what's happened, or you've got an emerging situation going on and you're trying to predict what's, what's going to happen. Sometimes you use a model to, if you've got data points, for so, you've got some observations and you've got data points over time, you'll use that model to interpolate between data points so you don't have to do more expensive human trials or animal trials or trials in general. Um, but it can be dangerous to extrapolate outside of the regime you've got data in because you don't really know what's going to happen. Um, so, so yeah, you're, we're forced into these, this compromise between accuracy and transparency. Um, and for, as, a, as a mathematician rather than a computer scientist, I'd always argue that it's better to have a simple model that you can understand and play around with the equations on than this wonderful computer simulation that you kind of get lot, lose the wood for the trees with. Uh, so... There are, and this is a very limited further reading slide, um, uh, as this is in collaboration with Imperial, I probably should have put Anderson and May up rather than Keeling and Rahani, but that's a, that's a side, <laughs> that's a, a, a diplomatic incident. Um, so, um, but yeah, so there are textbooks on how to, sort of basic to entry level tech, entry-ish level textbooks on um, modeling infectious disease. Uh, there's a, if you're interested in the, the modeling advice for flu, um, there is an internet, if you look for SPI-M modeling summary, um, you, you, you can find our sort of compiled advice on what we know and what we think we know about pandemics of flu. And there are obviously academic papers um, where we've sort of published some of these ideas, which can be a bit more impenetrable, perhaps, but um, they, they, they exist. Um, so, so, yeah, many thanks for listening. Um, the, uh, the disclaimer slide, um, uh, these views are my own. <laughs> um, and the emergency preparedness and response <coughs> to the LIU is a, another health protection research unit that I'm funded by, um, uh, which is looking at um, emergency preparedness and response issues rather than modelling methodological issues. Um, so at that point, I will stop talking. Any, any questions? Yeah, you you talked about the the, the R not varying. Yeah, uh, and one of your slides you showed that there was a range of values of the flu. Mm. Mm. Uh, when you 
design the flu vaccine, uh, you're, you're looking forward, I think, 12, 20 months. Um, so you actually decide how many doses you want to, and how many people you want to, so that's a policy decision as to how you're going to go for. But then you have to order the number of doses because it doesn't appear overnight, you see it, stuck by it mm. in advance. Is there any way that you can put confidence levels in your models that uh, allow the policy makers to make better rational decisions about stockpiling of, 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 of vaccines, things like that? Yes is the simple answer. Um, the slightly more complicated answer is that's quite hard, but you can design models that allow for multiple strains circulating. You're, you're still sort of putting a, a guess at which strain is going to be the one that becomes dominant. Um, and there's, 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 there's sort of some science to that. Um, but yeah, so, so, so yeah, there are, I mean, Neil at Imperial um, and, and colleagues have um, done precisely that, tried to sort of build fairly complicated models that allow for different um, strains circulating, looking at um, the, the, the benefit, um, so that you can make, make recommendations about stockpile size. Because one of the things that doesn't happen is you don't tell the general public what's coming over the horizon. Yeah. So every flu campaign looks like the last one. Yeah. And I think there's a bit of a tendency to say, well, I didn't get it last year, why do I bother this year? Yeah, yeah. And I think what the nuance really there is is the pandemic issue. So you can't predict what the pandemic is going to be. Yeah. So, so if there was a pandemic, that would be novel. And your, your seasonal vaccine is always going to be wrong. Um, you, you might have some cross-protection. You might get lucky. But, that, yeah, that's... Um, uh, yes, I mean, it, it is... Um, uh, the it's always kind of worth getting a vaccine, um, but I can understand the, the 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 human aspect of of sort of a complacency, especially when you are relatively young and healthy, and flu doesn't affect you badly. Um, but yeah, as as you become into the sort of age group that would have more severe outcomes, um, that, that, that risk perception may change. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, it, yeah, the individual cost-benefit analysis or whatever is, is probably quite nuanced, um, but that's a behavioural issue. So, <laughs> I, I wonder actually to what extent people are really aware of I mean, when I was an employed person, I didn't really think about this because I, one of the things I, I realised quite late in the day was if you're off sick, you actually get your NHS contributions stopped, <coughs> your, your, your national insurance contributions to stop, so you get a higher paycheck at the end of the month than if you're healthy, which is interesting. Um, if you're self-employed and you're sick, you get nothing. You get no work, you lose work, so there's no opportunity cost, and being sick can be very expensive. Mm. And I wonder to what extent people actually realise that in terms of their own behaviours, because a lot of people today are on zero-hour contracts. They don't work, don't work. They don't get paid. Mm. Do they realise that, say, the opportunity cost could be quite high? And the cost of a vaccine is actually quite low, relatively speaking. I mean, you can go along to the chemist and get it done for almost nothing. Cheaper than a few round of beers. But I don't think people realise that. This sounds like a discussion for the next session. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Because we are, we are now at, at the coffee break. So if you hold on to that thought, sure. and we can discuss it in the next session. Well, yeah, but no, I think that is, that is a sort of has the benefit, I guess, of these sorts of situations that you, yeah, we're we're looking at it from a more population level than the individual level often. So, so yeah, that's a good point for discussion later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that is that is the challenge. Yeah. Ian, I have a really quick one, which is, what was the reproduction number for Ebola? Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, so, so Ebola is, um, uh, I, I'm going to say, I can't remember, is the simple answer. But um, Ebola is a slightly more nuanced infection uh, than, than flu um, because you, you have, it, people have to be, are very poorly when they're ill. They are, it's, it's the bodily fluids that are infectious. And so really your, 
it's the caregiver that is at risk of infection rather than the people in the population around. So that may be a nurse, it may be a professional caregiver, it may be someone in the household. And then there's also the, the burial, the dead body aspect. So, so you're almost equally infectious as a, as a person when you're alive and when you're dead if your body is managed in a particular way, which culturally is, is an issue. So in some respects, the reproduction number is a sort of average concept. In some, for some infections, it's not a great concept because that you have to have such strong contact to cause infection. Um, uh, so, so, so pneumonic plague would also be a similar thing where you, you're really poorly and you're, it's, you're coughing up rather than sneezing, you're coughing up quite heavy particles that just sort of settle. So you have to be very close. And so if you look at documented outbreaks of pneumonic plague and, and Ebola as a viral hemorrhagic fever is quite similar, those documented medical outbreak reports are, it's the person that was giving care. So historically, in a house or in a sort of community setting without professional health care, it's the mothers or the grandmothers that are becoming the next case when the children or the husband become infected and bring the infection into the house. And then when they die, the husband will bring some little old lady in from the village down the road and, and get them to be the caregiver and they take it back to their house. And so you can see the sort of social, personal story in some of these outbreak reports. Um, so, so I didn't answer Richard's question, but I, I managed to waffle till he forgot the... Uh, <laughs> but no, it's... So it, what you're saying is that it's, it's the... It, you, you, your own not is a function of, of not just the virulence of the, of, of the infection, but the chain of contact of, or, 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 or spread that it takes. Yeah, yeah there's, there's two aspects that, that are hidden um, in the simple models. One is your, your social... your desire for social contact, so... so your sort of movement a bit, uh, and and your mo movement ability. So, as you become more ill, your ability to leave the house, or whatever, becomes lower. So you you, you stay more, you're more bedridden, um, or hospitalised, or sort of basically you're self isolated. Whereas your infectiousness probably, your inherent infectiousness probably goes up. So so. So your peak infectiousness is probably somewhere in the middle, while you're still a little bit ambulatory, but you're not at your peak infectiousness. So, so it can be quite complicated. Um, and you see that with smallpox, um, uh, because there, that you have this sort of period where you're feeling a bit poorly, but you're probably not really sick, where you, you haven't got obvious symptoms. You have your, we call it prodromal. You, you, have, you don't have the rash, but you just feel a bit fluey. And you're still probably going about your business, so you're meeting people. Um, but once you start getting the rash, like chicken pox, you would start being more infectious. But you're, because of the way smallpox affects you, you're probably bedridden at that point. So, so yeah, it's, it then come, becomes a household problem rather than a population problem. And so we have, different, we have models specifically to look at <coughs> such infections where there's a household structure. Um, so, so, yeah, it's... Um, just make a point, and then I think we have to move on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ian, because I definitely understand much more about modeling. <laughs> but I think actually from the questions, I can see actually an appetite for more for modeling. So we can talk about it at the end of the session today, because here we, we are going to talk about a specific project. But hopefully yeah. we are going to do more work with the modeling. But I can see actually from the questions that there are many, many it, it, there is an interest in the area, so hopefully we'll have the time to discuss some of the issues in the following up sessions. Okay. Yep. Thank cool. you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Fantastic.